an X-Men omnibus that's out of print and sells for a ton of money on the aftermarket, that's written by Chris Claremont, that's drawn by Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri. It's got to be a good book, right? Eh. So we're going to do a giveaway where you can win my entire Dragon Ball Z Funko Pop collection. Stay tuned at the end of the video, and I'll tell you guys how you can win. All right, guys, I just slogged through the X-Men Omnibus Volume 1. Like I said, this is written by Chris Claremont. It's drawn by uh, Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri, although Jim Lee seems to only have a few issues in here. But, man, this was a chore to get through. I was so disappointed in this book, but there were a couple of glimmers of hope. And we're going to start with what I liked first. First of all, we get Uncanny X-Men 244 through 269. 244 is the first appearance of Jubilee. And the comic plays out just the way they did it on the animated series. You could tell that they drew a lot of inspiration from this. Jubilee is a mall rat type of punk kid. Think uh, John Connor from Terminator 2. Or more like his sidekick buddy, your boy uh, Sputnik from Salute Your Shorts. But um, she's a super punk teen and... She's in the mall and you have a sentinel attack or I can't remember if there's a sentinel attack or you have she she, she witnesses Psylocke storm and I think Jean Grey and they look glamorous and she's all intrigued into the mutants and she follows them. But there's an attack. The Jubilee stuff in this book was good. We see her relationship with Wolverine. She kind of rescues him. They go to Madripoor. And all of the Jubilee Wolverine stuff was, was well written and was interesting. They kind of make her look like Robin from Batman a little bit. If you see her like trademark yellow jacket, but then she has like red and green on and it looks a lot like Robin. The Rogue having Carol Danvers' psyche in her and kind of sometimes Carol Danvers has control, sometimes, sometimes Rogue has control. That stuff was pretty cool as well. Uh, that kind of struggle within... Then we get uh, Uncanny X-Men issue 249, which is the first Jim Lee work on the X-Men title. Anytime Jim Lee is drawing on this book, it looks absolutely great. Mark Silvestri, I mean, he's a great artist, but all the issues that he penciled were, like, boring as hell, man. But anytime you saw Jim Lee do, like, Psylocke or Wolverine, it was just incredible in this book. Obviously, I liked, like I said, the Jim Lee pencils. Scott Williams inked a lot of that stuff was great. His Psylocke stuff was good, even though it was really confusing with her whole taking over Betsy Braddock's body. They kind of really don't define who she was before taking over Betsy Braddock. But um, that was okay. We get uh, Uncanny X-Men 266, the first appearance of Gambit, which was really good, along with 267, which was kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, really weird with this kind of kid version of Storm. We'll talk more about that later when I talk about the things that I don't like. Then the following issue, issue 260, 268, with that classic Cap, Wolverine, and Black Widow cover, was Probably the best issue in this entire book. It was awesome. I like how they flip back and forth from 1941 to present time. And Cap and Wolverine, that's where they first interacted and then where they're interacting now. Uh, going against, um, that's Von Strucker, I believe. And even the next issue, the issue where it's like kind of a rogue's back and she's fighting like this zombified Carol Danvers, Miss Marvel. So all that stuff was pretty great. And I know it sounds like a lot of the book was good. But really, like, 80% of this book is, like, almost unreadable. We're at this weird kind of transitioning phase of the X-Men where it's after Fall of the Mutants, it's after Inferno, the whole world thinks that the X-Men are dead, and we really only have a team of Colossus, Havoc, Banshee, you have Psylocke before she's in ninja garb, you have Rogue, Moira McTaggart, uh, and we get some Forge stuff, so that's pretty much it. But the problem is, the majority of these issues, like, they have, like, little to no panel time. Like, these X-Men books don't contain any X-Men. And we're going to flip through. I'm going to show you guys what I'm talking about. But there are pages and pages of and pages that are filled with dialogue from characters that you never hear from again. Like, why do we need to know so much about this little army platoon that's not going to be here in the next issue? We get their names, all this banter between them, and you never see them again. You had the stuff with the Reavers, which is so drawn out. Uh, the guy with their leader, Pierce. I couldn't stand any of that shit. And if it's not some army squad, some Reavers squad, you have some politicians, and it's just so boring, so dull. Like, I don't mind dialogue in books. Like, I'll read a novel. Like, I don't care. As long as it's interesting. But it's not. It's not even our main characters that are having on this dialogue. It's all these side characters that don't even matter. And that's what really kills this book. 
That being said, uh, I voiced my my kind of uh, opinions in the Facebook group, Geminites, and a lot of people were like, yo, we know that was kind of the roughest part of Uncanny, but it's all worth it when it leads up to the 90s X-Men run, which is what Volume 2 leads into. So actually, uh, we need to check really quick. I don't think this picks up right after. The Extinction Agenda is in between these two books. Yeah, mine's still sealed, actually. Yeah, so this ends at uh, Uncanny 269. Yeah, this goes actually, this is kind of odd. It goes a little bit before this book with 235 to, uh, through 238. Then it picks up at 272 through 272. Then all the little tie-ins, and then it goes into volume two. So I was supposed to mention this in the beginning, but I wanted to do like a little X-Men read-along. I wanted to start with the 90s team and kind of go into all these OHCs that I haven't read yet, like Bishop's Crossing and Extinction Agenda, uh, the Phallic's Covenant, Executioner's Song. Uh, so I didn't want to start with Uncanny. I've read a lot of Uncanny X-Men back in the day, and I didn't want to get bogged down on three Omni. So I started with this one, and it was such a chore, man. But you know what's funny? Like, as much as I disliked all those boring pages and boring uh, issues, the, the issues that I liked, I really liked. Um, kind of a weird thing happens here where at one point, the world thinks all the X-Men are dead. And then they really are all dead. Like, Colossus is gone. Rogue is missing. Jean Grey is missing. Everybody's gone. Storm is gone. Then they start getting kind of reintroduced into the issues. But Storm's a child. And she doesn't remember anything. Same with Colossus. He can't change into metal. And I don't even remember. Or even... I don't even think that gets resolved in this. On how they come back. I know that Storm... Uh, it had to do with Nanny. Which was this terrible character... Uh, this big robot nanny with um, the orphan maker who's like this destroyer from Thor looking armored person, but is, he's really a baby. The nanny stuff, all that stuff reminds me of Louise Simonson. Uh, and she's a great writer, but I felt in the 80s she did like a lot of fantasy type of themes with superhero characters, which I'm not really into. I don't want it to feel like 80s fantasy. I want it to feel like, you know, superheroes in action. With that being said, it's funny. This book is sought after. It's out of print. But the material in it is really hit and miss. You know, so you have some really high highs, some really low lows. Let's flip through. And I'm sure you're going to see all of these boring pages I'm talking about. And we'll see the glimmers of hope as well. All right, let's dive in. So here you have the cover. Great looking cover. You got Strong Guy, Jubilee, Psylocke, Wolverine, Storm, Forge, Rogue, Beast, uh, we get Strong Guy, but he, he really isn't Strong Guy. He's just Guido, right? And he's with, um, I think he's with Psylocke. So that's the front. Here's the spine. Here's the back covers. Like I said, 244, first appearance of Jubilee. 249, first Jim Lee work on the X-Men. Then you have... I think this is the first time Psylocke joins the team. I could be wrong. There's something about this issue. Maybe it's first first Jim Lee Psylocke. Uh, then what else do we have? First appearance of Gambit. A lot of people don't give this issue any love, but it's the second part of that story. Classic cover here. Probably the best issue in the entire book. And um, you can see what it collects here. It originally had a $125 cover price. I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be a reprint one day, but... Maybe with the, some of this content as slow as it was, maybe that's why Marvel hasn't jumped at that. The inside of the dust jacket has some information on where the team is at and some uh, blurbs about the creators. Typical old school Marvel omnibus, black leather, silver foil letters and fonts and logos. Yeah, this is going to be the highlight of this book. The Gambit story was cool too, man, but it was just weird how he was with this childlike storm the whole time. So yeah, see, it takes place after Fall of the Mutants, after Inferno, which I did a review on Inferno actually last year already. So here we get Jubilee for the first time. She's showing off in the mall. She sees the uh, women of X-Men and she kind of uh, is intrigued by them. I mean, they teleport out with Gateway. I, I don't think there's a Sentinel attack. I think they just did that in the cartoon. I think it was confusing the two of them. All right, so let's start looking at um, the things that I didn't like about this book, right? So already, I mean, there's a lot of stuff like this. Like, little to no X-Men stuff. 
and eventually in this book they all go away. They're all rolling with Gateway in, in the beginning. That's Psylocke there. They have some Dazzler stuff too. Okay, so here's a page of what I'm talking about. Okay, so that's Wolverine. But for the most part, you got two full pages full of dialogue from these characters that it's like, who even cares, man? Here's some Rogue stuff. This is the Colossus stuff where we lose uh, Storm for a little while. Yeah, so I guess it's after that. Uh, when, once we lose the X-Men, there's like so many issues that... <laughs> Don't have any X-Men in it. Uh, let's see here. Look at this. Two full pages. You get Polaris, which she kind of just grows like to be this She-Hulk type character out of nowhere. But a bunch of stuff. A lot of dialogue with not much X-Men. See here. You're reading all this? Who are these people? Why do I care so much about nobody? You know what I mean? Look, no X-Men. Still none. I thought this issue was going to be pretty good. I, actually, it, it was a, a nice uh, refresher in between all the non-X-Men related stuff. It was kind of weird, though. Like, there are scenes where the villains who have Wolverine captured are talking. I think I guess it's the Reavers. Here we go. Here's an example. Like... I forget if these are the... I think these are the Reavers. But look how much dialogue, man. Like... With, like, no X-Men stuff. Some Lady Deathstrike stuff. Here we go again, like... Look at this. Super boring. And then they have this whole weird thing where all the mutants, like are coming back, but they can't be seen in mirrors or on cameras like they're vampires or something. Look at this. All these who all these people, who cares, man? I guess is that Banshee? But still, like, look at this. Here too. Two full pages, full of dialogue, no X-Men. Here we go again. Polaris is pretty badass, though. They have a little bit of Legion stuff as well. Like, see, it's su su such a lack of X Men. Look at this page, too. None. I don't care about any of these characters. See, here goes Jubilee. Now she's starting to look a little bit like Robin, right? This was cool. Wolverine comes back. They're in Madripoor now. So here was Jim Lee's doing Psylocke and Jim Lee doing Wolverine. Then, then we're getting somewhere. He goes Patch Wolverine. The Banshee and Forge stuff was like, okay, let's get back into like some X-Men at least. This was kind of whack too. Colossus comes back, but he might as well not even be Colossus because he doesn't even know who he is. Can't use his powers. The stuff with this guy Mask was super weird, man. Like they make G Jean Grey and um, Banshee kind of deformed, and it's kind of like Inferno again. Look at this. Who are any of these people, and why should I care? Same again. I guess it's Dazzler, but still super boring. Yeah, so here's where Jean Grey, Grey comes out of nowhere. It doesn't even feel like Jean Grey. Here we go. Two full pages. You got some... Yeah, you got Forge, but still, like... And then, like I said, they, they start doing that Louise Simonson fantasy type stuff, that Inferno type stuff. I wasn't really feeling that. What's going on here? Two full pages. Don't care about anything here. Beast shows up for one issue. Most ridiculous characters ever. Nanny and the Orphan Maker. Fantasy, Simonson, Vibe. Little Baby, Storm. Who are these characters anywhere here? None of that matters. These people too. 
So we get Gambit. It's funny, uh, at first, Gambit, his energy is green, you know, and it, and it ends up becoming uh, more pink, you know, as he gets more defined. He goes, that's the first look at Gambit, actually. And 266. He only wears his G-string on the cover, too. Anyway, so the Gambit stuff comes in, and that's pretty cool. And then in the next issue, they're in New Orleans, a.k.a. Nowlands. And that's pretty dope. It's actually a way better. Two of the more stronger issues here. And then, yeah, this one is definitely the, the strongest issue. You get Cap and Wolverine versus the hand. Black Widow versus the hand. It was a really good issue. Jim Lee really shining here. Look at this Wolverine, Psylocke. Still got Robin looking. Um, Jubilee. Great artwork. So, like I said, really high highs. But really low, boring lows. Uh, I still don't really understand what happened with this Captain Marvel coming back. It was dope when Rogue takes Gateway's powers and she even like gets his skin tone and stuff and his curly hair and such. But um, this X Men Classic on the uh, issue was really good. Yeah, this was really good. But to be honest, I skipped this what if, man. This super goofy, cartoony thing. I was like, man, I slogged through enough on this book. Then we get a Jim Lee cover gallery. For Alpha Flight, a Marvel Age cover he did. Punisher War Journal covers, which look dope. Punisher Wolverine, African Saga, Jim Lee cover. Alpha Flight Wraparound. He goes with some what ifs and Marvel superhero spring special Wolverine patch covers. That was used for the video game too. So this cover, this book actually has a um. Oh yeah, let's look right here. Actually has a DM variant, which is this. I've seen it one time at Tate's Comics, and I was like, oh, damn, I didn't even know it had a different cover. And I'm pretty sure it was this one that was kind of recolored. It's a great cover, but it's not wraparound. They just have black borders on the top and the bottom. So for the omnibus, it didn't look that good. Very cool to throw in Jim Lee's trading cards, trade paperback covers, recolored for both of these issues for trades. And that's it, y'all. This is the cover of the dust jacket. All right, guys, we're doing a worldwide giveaway for this uh, 33 Funko Pop Dragon Ball Z collection. All you have to do to enter is be subscribed to the channel and comment down below, hashtag DBZ giveaway. It's going to be one entry per person. Anybody could win. This is going to be a worldwide giveaway. Just be subscribed, comment below, and once the comments start slowing down, we'll do a live drawing during one of our Sunday streams. So comment below and good luck. All right, guys, that's my review on X-Men Volume 1, Chris Claremont, Jim Lee, and Mark Silvestri. Overall, uh, it was super slow, super boring, but had a couple of really, really great issues. I'm excited to jump into the Extinction Agenda and then read Volume 2 and then jump into all those other oversized hardcovers that I mentioned. Uh, am I tripping? Let me know what you think about this run by Chris Claremont. I know a lot of people in the Facebook group agreed that it was super slow, but it gets better. So let me know your thoughts. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and that you hit the notification bell. We're doing multiple giveaways in between random videos, and we're on our way to uh, 50,000 subscribers where we're going to give away this XM Studios Spider-Man statue that I have above me. And uh, we're going to get there pretty soon, guys. So make sure you're subscribed, hit that bell, hit the like, and stay minty fresh. Peace.